Um, we're going to uh, hear from a few other people now. Uh, first, we're going to hear from uh, Yossi Ginsberg. Um, Yossi's experiences of a fight for survival are astonishing, but more amazing is his storytelling ability. Practical messages such as self-belief, finding the strength to face unforeseen challenges, and innovating to stay ahead of the pack are seamlessly interwoven into his stories. Yossi's stories capture audience intents and, and deliver powerful and often hidden meanings. Yossi has been booked by many of the world's leading businesses and has shared the stage with speakers such as Bill Clinton and Richard Branson. Yossi also is an incredible tech entrepreneur, and I'd like to welcome him now to the stage. Jungle is a true story based on an amazing um, novel that I found incredible and as a movie it will be one of the great survival stories of all time. When he was 20 years old, Yossi Ginsberg went on a backpacking tour through South America and he got uh, lost in the Amazon jungle with two friends and a tour guide and halfway into the journey they realised that the guide turned out to be potentially a murderer, potentially a criminal, and definitely a liar. <laughs> Several times during this amazing escape story where the cat where he should have died. This is a jaguar that's hunting him and stalking him the entire way. Deadly fire ants. He almost drowns in quicksand. Incredible storm that almost took out the entire Amazon River. And there are headhunters and cannibals. He almost starves to death. We plan to make it into a compelling, action-packed, incredibly cinematic, very, very visual piece of storytelling. It speaks of the universal ability of the human being to survive in, in, in impossible situations. <laughs> We can talk about everything, all right? Yes, the screenplay does a really phenomenal job of capturing the essence of this amazing book, which is really a sprawling epic survival of the human spirit tale. Good afternoon. So, I was the one, in a way, left behind. I was five days when I really realized that uh, there's no other survivor and that I'm on my own. At that moment, the realization was so heavy that I completely collapsed. And my dream, my lifelong dream, became the worst nightmare possible. Here I was, lost, alone, bare to the bone. No provisions, no knife, no gun, no experience in this part of the world. And I was not equipped to deal with such circumstances, let alone this was, the, in retrospective, the worst rainy season in a decade deep in the uncharted Amazon, I was completely crushed by life. You know, I, I was crying. This was like the, the nadir of my life, at the lowest point possible, where I realized what a stupid, vain person I was, thinking I can challenge these elements and be the great explorer here I was, so, total surrender. When you reach such a low point in your life, when you reach 
the lowest point possible <laughs> where nothing can get worse than that. There's something, in a way, good about it. Because first of all, it's a total crush of the ego. You know you're nothing. You know you cannot help yourself. But also losing everything, there's an enlightenment there. Because when you lose everything, you realize also most of what you had wasn't yours anyhow. If it can be taken from you, it's not yours to begin with. And when you, you lose really everything, you also lose that mask. You, know? you also lose what you pretend all the time. You also lose that sense of shame, that sense of inadequacy, that sense of insecurity. It's a tough exercise um, to lose everything. We usually never reach that point of losing everything. But I lost it all. And here I was on my fifth day alone with that realization that there's no other survivors. I have to deal with it alone. As a broken man, victim of the worst possible circumstances on this planet, I walk on the cliffs down river hundreds of miles away from civilization. For the last four days, I haven't eaten anything. There was nothing for me to eat. I had no gun to hunt. I had no knife to cut or dig. And suddenly, from afar, I see a fruit lying on a rock. And as I look at that fruit, you know, I start walking. It's like really a perfect fruit. It's plump and, and round, and it's not rotten, and it's got no worms. And it's just a perfect root, fruit waiting on a rock. And as I, I, I reach to it, instantly I just take that fruit and put it in my mouth. At that moment, something strange happens to me, because it seems that for a second I'm just, I, lo I lose my bearings. It feels like an explosion inside my head, just that rush of sugar into my head. And in that moment, there seems to be a, a, like, I don't know if it's an hallucination or what it is, but I hear a voice inside my head. And the voice is like big and commanding. And the voice is saying, get more, get more of that. And I open my eyes and I see I'm under a tree laden with fruit. And I hear that command. So what I do, I jump on the tree, and I start climbing. You know, and I grab a branch, and I pull my body up the tree, and I grab another branch, and here's the first fruit. I'm about to touch the first fruit on the tree. And as I reach towards the, tr the fruit, something moves, and something contracts. It's a snake. But not just a snake. This is the deadliest snake in the Amazon basin. This is a fruit snake that, upon a bite, it kills. Within 30 seconds, you die. However, if that snake doesn't reach you, it can spit venom into your eyes and blind you. So I'm about to touch that snake. As the snake contracts, something strange happens because I don't have time to think about the situation. So I'm just experiencing the situation. And the situation is that I let go of my other hand. And hence, I'm falling off the tree down to the rocks underneath the tree. I'm talking about five, six yards. But something strange happens. Instead of just falling down and crashing on the rocks, something very strange happens. I'm not falling, but floating. So I can see how slowly, slowly I'm reaching the ground, which allows me to align my body while in the air and just perfectly fall without hurting myself. And as I land perfectly on the rock, my body already moves to the right and left, and I grab a stick. I check if it's strong enough, and I jump back on the tree. Now I start chasing the snake in the tree. The snake is in trouble, not me. And when I get to the snake, I, I take the, the stick. At one time, I hit it, and off the snake flies off the tree in the air. And off, I'm in the air after the snake. When I land on the rocks, I, I grab a rock, and I just one time throw it at the snake, and one time is enough. The snake is dead. I grab the snake. And, I, and, I, and I, I just, with one finger, clean his, you know, just pull his, his, his skin off. And then I put the finger again, and I clean the guts. 
of the snake, and then I'm standing there and I'm chewing that snake alive. Now, all this just happened. There's nothing of my doing. I didn't do anything. But what I feel now is my entire body throbbing with power. What I experience is a total sense of calm, a, a total sense of belonging. Actually, I never felt so good in my life. That's the truth. Now, what has happened? A minute ago, I was a victim of the worst possible circumstances on the planet. A minute later, I never felt so good in my life. I was at home. I belong. What has happened is, you know, like I call it activation. You know, basically, this is something very simple that we all own. It's not like, you know, we are the heroes of the story of our lives. But we play it as extras. That's what we play. You know, the social mask that we're wearing, it's never daring to be the hero. It's much more comfortable at the extra position. But in real adventure, in real life risking situation, there's no place for extras. The hero has to come into play, and the hero is there to take that role. We know what to do. We are adequate. We can respond to the situation. It's just that the situation is mostly not tough enough, so we can be victims. But when the situation is really tough, there is no place, and there is no time to be a victim. There's only one thing you can do when the situation is really extreme, and that take right action. This is the essence, the essence of responsibility. Because responsibility is being able to respond. And we, as a generation, we are irresponsible. We rather believe in some conspiracy theory because it makes somebody else responsible. So we can stick to the victim situation. We don't assume responsibility, the ability to respond. And I would say this was like uh, one of the biggest, most amazing um, effects on my life, you know, assuming that position of responsibility. Right now I'm responsible for anything that is going on on this planet. Because all it means, I'm able to respond. Even compassion is a response. Okay? If there's like adversity in Africa, you can at least respond with compassion. But don't say I'm not responsible. Don't say I cannot do anything about it. We can do something about it, always. And we never have to be victims. We cannot escape from adversity. Adversity is not a choice in life, but the victim is a choice. So, another thing that happened with this moment of activation is that essence of feeling so good, but just meeting that point in time as it unfolds and taking the right action. And that changed my shift from one of the greatest false values of our times. It's such a great value that it's even written into the American Constitution, the pursuit of happiness. And I say it's false, because the pursuit of happiness suggests that happiness will come later. Otherwise, we don't have to pursue it. So we pursue something in the future we have the right to be happy later. And when will we be happy later? When everything will work the way we want it. When everything will play to satisfy us. In this delusional, illusion situation, we will be happy, which is never. So I've changed my perspective. And I say, the pursuit should be the pursuit of happiness, not happiness. Because happiness is my ability to respond to life as it unfolds in this moment. And if you do that, that's happiness. Happiness is the ability to meet every moment and take the proper action to it. 
My life was saved. I hope you can read the book, watch the movie. And I don't have time to tell you that story, but I survived. And part of the, my survival was because one of my friends did survive, and he came back after me, but he didn't come back alone. He came back with the indigenous people that pulled him from the river, and they brought him up to, in search for me. It was impossible, but miracles do happen in life. So, 10 years later, I arrive at the Amazon because I want to say thank you to the people that saved my life. And this is a very remote village of indigenous tribe, the Takana, that live away, away from the remote jungle town. They are a day upriver from that jungle town. And when I make my way to them to say thank you for saving my life, there's a council of the elderly, very cunning people, very smart. They ambush me and say, you came to thank you, to thank us for saving your life, but our life is in danger. We are all dying here. Will you help us save our life? In the beginning, I didn't understand what was, was they talking about, some, some disease or something, but no. What happened is progress. The youth don't want to live the ancestral life. That's what happens. And one by one, they leave the village, and they never come back. And when the youth is living and not coming back, the entire village is dying. And they said, we have a dream. Our dream is to give, because the youth is living because they want what you have. They want to make some money. They want progress. So they go to the jungle towns around, and they become cheap labor, because they are like the, the, the wild people deep in the bush. They are the untouchables. They are the lowest. So they wash dishes and, and scrub and clean, but at least they make a few pesos. We have a dream. What our dream is, that we'll build a re resort here, because this is untouchable rainforest. And people from all over the world would come here to see that beauty. And our youth will be the guides, and the maids, and the cooks, and the motormen. Not only they'll be able to make money from all the tourists, they'll also be able to take pride in their culture and explain about our life in the forest. This is our dream. And I thought, what a terrible idea. I mean, these people must be so naive because they don't know what they're talking about. This is a very remote part of the world. It's impossible to even get here. The only way to get to the jungle town is by flight. There's only one flight a week. It's usually canceled because the landing strip is of grass. This is the raining forest. The rainforest, it's always raining. The flights are canceled. The second way to get here is by road from 5,200 meters, La Cumbre Pass in the Andes, all the way down to the lowland 600 meters. It's officially the most dangerous road on the planet. It's called the road of death. You check it out. This is the most dangerous road on the planet. Mini buses and buses fall into the abyss on a daily basis. It's one lane in a misty uh, forest. It's impossible to get even to the jungle town. And if you go to the jungle town, how, you, how do you go to the you know, this is dugout canoe pushed against the stream. If it's too much water, it floods, you don't get there. If it's not enough water, you get to, to get out of the boat and pull it and push it. How do you bring tourists to that village? It's impossible. But how could I tell them? This is their dreams. They're trying to save their lives. They saved my life. Should I tell them that this is a stupid, naive dream? So I tell them this is a great idea. And of course I can help you, and I will help you. Now, I'm an extreme time type of person. So I quit my life, and I joined them. Just that you understand, I moved there, and I lived with them for three years on that river in the Amazon. And their dream became my dream. Now, naivete and dreams, they go together. If you're a naive dreamer, there's a chance you'll achieve it. Because if you're a professional dreamer, you know it's impossible. And what happens? If you know something it's impossible, it is impossible. If you don't know it's impossible, it is possible. It's as simple as that. We, they didn't know it's impossible, so it was possible. So, but now I needed to help them. Now, how, how would I help them? Because I don't know anything about the rainforest. Apart from my adventure story, I have nothing to do. I mean, but I have one ability. I can learn. So I started learning. 
So I read one paper and, and, and another paper, and I learn, first of all, terminology. Oh, biodiversity. Oh, intellectual properties of indigenous people. Oh, sustainability, uh, by, um, you know, like uh, uh, biodiversity prospecting, ethnobotany. I start learning and learning. And then in one single article, I got enlightened. And I want to share that enlightenment because it changed my life forever. And it was a very simple article. It was um, an article about, um, it was the biodiversity count of mapping, biodiversity mapping of a certain area not, not far from, from that village. And it's, it was done randomly. When you do biodiversity mapping, there's three approaches. One is called the taxonomic approach, which means you know families of plants and minerals and, 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 and flora and fauna, and you look for relatives. The second one is called et the ethnobotanical approach, which is the most efficient, by the way. That means you follow the shamans, and they show you. And the third is called random, which means you pick every single species, and you map it. On a small area, of course, you can do a random. This was a random, which means everything was mapped. And this article was actually at four columns. One column was name of species. Second column was renewable. Third was non-renewable. And fourth was economic value. So this was all. Name, renewable, non-renewable, economic value. At the bottom of this short article, enlightenment was awaiting. And the enlightenment was simple. The economic value of renewable resources by far exceeds the economic value of non-renewable resources. When I saw that, my world has changed. Because what that meant is that a living, healthy forest is a better business than an exploited forest. It's not better for humanity. It's not better for future generation. It's not about the air we breathe. It's not about the water we drink. It's not about the medicine of it's just simply better business, more money for us now. I couldn't believe it. It's better business to keep the forest intact than to exploit it. Based on that idea, I wrote a three-pager. And I flew to Washington, DC, where I was extremely well connected. Because I had yellow pages and quarters. So I started making phone calls from a phone booth. And after so many phone calls, one organization agreed to meet me. It was the Inter-American Development Bank, the small loan department of the Inter-American Development Bank. I came with my three pagers and told them that story. The head of the department said, sir, we have to ask you two things, please. The first is you have to promise us not to talk to any other organization in this town. I didn't know what that means. I just didn't understand. And I said, sir, I don't understand. I said, look, we will give you everything that you need, but don't talk to anybody else. I said, OK. I said, the second thing, Mr. Ginsburg, we cannot give you the amount of money that you're asking. Because I calculated that for us to do this project, we need $250,000. He said, the minimum we can give is a million and a half. Mr. Ginsburg, you'll have to take a million and a half. I said, OK. <laughs> One meeting. We went and built that village. But what we didn't know is how, how far naivete took us. First of all, I was nobody. No legal entity, no background, no organization. But they wanted the idea so much because it was timely. It was transition from con cons conservation to sustainable development. That was the time, the moment of transition. So this idea was so innovative. They wanted it. So they went the extra mile and did something that never happened before. They gave the money to the indigenous people directly. This was unprecedented, because the message of that is that indigenous people can help themselves. And I, I swear, I got threats to my life from NGOs. I got serious threats to my life from NGOs, because the NGOs were very upset. Because the NGOs are there to save the indigenous people. And if the indigenous people save themselves, the NGOs are not happy. Now then, <coughs> I just realized 
I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, this village, till this day, is the phenomena. You know, I just tell you, you know, like the other thing, the entire area was changed and from exploitation to sustainable development. The untouchable people are the biggest employer in town. They're the biggest agency. The city people work for them. And people from all over the world fly to this resort. And also, another thing we didn't know, this er entire area was declared a national park. This national park touches on one side a Peruvian national park, on another side a Brazilian national park, and created by connecting the two, the biggest defense belt in the Amazon. We didn't even know. We didn't even know. <laughs> we had no idea. This is how powerful is a naive dream. Now, <clears throat> I'll just uh, tell you that that idea was really on a level of enlightenment. Because what does it mean that a healthy forest makes more money than an exploited one? Actually, it's so clear. Isn't it that a healthy body will produce more than a diseased body? Isn't it so obvious? Can't we see that something healthy will do more, will give more, will produce more? Why, why do we destroy the environment? For profit. But if we protect it, there's more profit. Don't you see the irony? There's more money to be made. Not talking about doing good, not talking about philosophy. There's more money to be made. How can we be so stupid? How can it be? Um, and by the way, saving the forest is like saving the world. It's the same thing. You know, a healthy planet will produce more, not less. And we destroyed everything on this planet for greed. But actually, greed would have been more satisfied if we would protect the planet. Something doesn't make sense here. And what doesn't make sense, I, I dedicated many years to research that. And I just tell, tell you quickly, it's like, it's a paradigm. We, you know, paradigms is a must belief. There's two paradigms we believe in. One is the paradigm of scarcity, also known as the Malthusian equation. Exponential growth of population, finite resources means scarcity. Okay? So we believe there is not enough. And if there's not enough, we better take it quickly for ourselves. This is one logic. The other logic is the Darwinian, Darwinian equation. The strongest gets it. So we should compete with each other, and the better one take it, and the other will perish. Both of them are total nonsense. Sorry, with full humility. But the Malthusian equation is all tautology. First of all, Population doesn't grow exponentially. Population dances with the conditions around. It responds to the environment, first of all. Secondly, resources are not finite. If anything, they're infinite. Thirdly, in the equation, something is lacking. What is lacking is innovation. When you put innovation into equation, then everything changes. Okay? So the Malthusian equation should actually say there is infinite abundance. The Darwinian one is very dangerous. Because it's saying the survival of the fittest. I'm telling you there's no, no more meaning, meaningless declaration than the, the, the survival of the fittest. You know why? Because in nature, everybody is perfectly fit. So what does it mean, the survival of the fittest, if everybody is perfectly fit? It means nothing. Yet in society, with the rationale of Darwin, uh, elitist, upper class English, that's the thought behind Darwinism, not nature. In nature, there's abundance, and every, no, nothing goes extinct in nature unless one species intervenes and kills all the other species. Species do not disappear. Every species is perfectly adaptable to respond to the uh, changing conditions of the environment and survive, and they all do survive. But paradigm is something we all believe in. We all believe in the Malthusian paradigm that there's not enough, and we all believe in the Darwinian paradigm that we should compete with each other and the better one wins. If we knew that there is abundance and enough for all of us, we will change our strategy to cooperation. My time is up, so I have to go. But I have to tell you that I'm taking it further into technology. There, there, there is a need for paradigm shift. The paradigm shift means we have to think differently because what we say is seeing is believing. We look at the world around us and see that Malthus was right and Darwin was right. 
And you know why they were right? Because we believe in it. It's not seeing is believing, it's believing is seeing. What we believe as a mass creates the world as we see it. We need to change the way we believe in order to see the world around us change. Right now, I'm an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley, but my charter is the same charter. It's just that paradigm shift in technology where distribution of wealth is going not to the barons of databases and technology, but there is abundance and cooperation will drive technology to serve us instead of exploit us. That same uh, drive and understanding and enlightenment is what's pushing me today. And thank you so much for having me.